out this video. Just a heads up though, we're not showing actual wrestling footage as this is an internet wrestling radio show only and it may contain language that could be offensive to some. So if you can't handle it, giving you a heads up now, you may want to skip this episode. Thank you so much. Enjoy, comment, and subscribe. Hey YouTube, what's up? It's the Black Avenger, Lee Sanders here. Thank you so much for getting ready to check out this interview that I had did with the beautiful and the lovely Katarina Waters. Of course, you may better know her from her time in WWE as Katie Lee, Katie Birchhill, and then going on to TNA Wrestling under the ring name Winter. You know, I want to set this up properly for you guys. This was part of a whole episode from May 7, 2013, but we have remixed it for you all and just gave you all the interview itself. Now, if you want to check out the entire show, we definitely have that available in our archive section up on YouTube. So after you get done checking this out, feel free to backtrack. But if you just want the interview itself, you're definitely in for a special treat. We enhance the audio for you as always when it comes to our YouTube videos that we upload on here. And you know, I just want to set this up properly as this is someone whose career I've been following as early as her debut in the WWE and I've always just been very fascinated by the beautiful and the lovely Katarina Waters. I think she has brought to us some really cool gimmicks over the years and I definitely was rooting her on when she was teaming up with Paul Burchill. I thought what she was doing with him was some pretty good work. I definitely was sad like many of you out there probably that didn't like it when WWE had decided to release her because they really didn't use her to her truest potential as we heard all the buzz that she was making down in OVW. But lo and behold, it didn't take that much time for her to go to TNA Wrestling where really she was given that creative platform and finally the opportunity to shine. And she shined pretty damn well in the company. And she is just one of those few female wrestlers in my book that I just feel is so underrated as a performer. And in this interview, you can really tell that she's just really laid back, a real sweetheart, very cool and just real easy to get along with. I had a blast doing this interview with her. Now, we provided some links for you guys to go check her out so that you are always in the 411 on the latest that she's up to, projects and all. So after you get done checking this out, make sure you check out those links. Go visit her website. She's got some really cool autograph photos, all kinds of goodies that you can check out. Without any further ado, folks, here is my interview with the beautiful and the lovely Katarina Waters from May 7th, 2013. You end up liking this, be sure to hit that like button and be sure to leave those comments. And hey, be sure to subscribe. If you're checking out our channel for the first time, you end up liking this. Enjoy, folks. The following is an Infinity One Productions presentation. Keeping it honest, insightful, interactive. Covering the latest in wrestling and beyond. You're listening to the RCWR Show with Lee Sanders. Got a special guest that's in the house tonight. We've been hyping this up as early as last week, going into the weekend, and I'm very, very giddy for this. I have been trying to get her on the show at least for about a month, and it's just been about just catching up with one another. But finally, we we're able to do this for you guys tonight. Of course, it was selected as Walk Talk Radio staff pick of the day. So special shout-out to the folks over at Walk Talk Radio for featuring tonight's episode. We got the beautiful, we got the lovely... Katarina Waters, a.k.a. Katie Lee, or you may know her as Katie Birdchill, or Miss Winter from TNA. We're going to be talking all things wrestling, also find out the very latest projects that she's been working on. It's going to be a really fun, insightful interview, so just kick on back, relax, have some fun. You're going to enjoy this, trust me. we got a chat room open right now on blogtalkradio.com. You're more than welcome to jump on in there. 
post a few comments or questions if you have any for our special guests. You can also interact with us, as always, on Twitter. Hit us up at Infinity1Prod. You can also hit us up over at our new show handle at the RCWR Show. And uh, without any further ado, let's go on ahead and uh, let's go right for it. So, without any further ado, uh, Kat, are you there? Hello, I am. Hey, hello. How are you doing tonight? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm doing pretty good, thank you. Um, I, I just got to let you know that this um, this this what we're doing right here tonight, and th- this is true right here, what I'm about to say, our newer listeners they may not know, but our long-time listeners, they can definitely confirm this. We've been on the air for like a year plus. We've done about mm-hmm. 200 episodes and counting, and we've never had a female wrestler stop by the show. Oh, and, no. Yeah, I mean, we made history a couple <laughs> of months back. We welcomed our first female guest, but we never had a female pro wrestler, so it looks like tonight we're making a little bit of history. for. So for me... Personally, this uh, episode has that extra little bit of sentimental value to it. Well, I'm excited to be part of that. Oh, yeah, we appreciate that. Um, It's good that we're here tonight because I'd like to begin by asking you, um, and I thought this was a a, a great opening question here. I'd like to get your thoughts on your perspective, that is, on the current state of women's divisions, such as TNA, WWE. I mean, Mm -hmm. we go from your time in OVW back in 2006 to being called up the main WWE roster and, you know, afterwards departing, hitting the TNA up until 2012. You know, you had the opportunity to work with some really great performers such as Mickey James, Beth Phoenix, uh, ODB, Serena Webb. Um, It seems like there was a time where you could kick back and be excited to watch a women's match and truly feel invested. And I don't like saying this because I'm a huge fan of women's wrestling, but it seems like nowadays, at least when you look at certain promotions, like the ones I highlighted, it seems like for the most part people, they grow kind of bored quickly, and most feel that it's more of a filler match slash dark match than something to watch. It's been said that the women's division in TNA is stronger than WWE, but not on a consistent basis. How do you feel about both divisions from the companies, is, and is there anything that can be done to improve it? Um, yeah, well, I agree and disagree, because I find that um, TNA and WWE, I think, both have um, really good female wrestlers on their roster at the moment. Um, TNA obviously still has, you know, the ones that, that have been there, Gail Kim and Velvet and... Well, they've they've always had you know great women's wrestlers, and the matches are always great. I think it's just a shame that they've cut back on showcasing the girls. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't watched TNA in the last couple of months or so. But it, when I was there, we always had a locker room full of girls, and there was at least two girls segments. Whether it was two girls matches, or it was you know maybe one mixed match and one girls match, or at least the backstage segment or something going on. You know, there was always at least two segments, and there was the highest rated, and now it seems that they've cut down so much, like there's one match on the show, you know. And then WWE, I find actually that it's almost, like, in part has improved since I've been there, because um, when I was there, there were so many just six-girl diva matches where we had, like, an hour, and you, you might step foot in the ring and do a move or two. You know, it seems that they've cut out down on that, and they've had longer, you know, one-on-one girls' matches that, you know, I enjoy when I see them. It just seems that there, too, um, they don't have, I think in both, well, maybe not so much TNA, but WWE, I find that they don't have enough of the girls' storylines. You know, they've had some great feuds, you know, some great girl feuds over over the time, and it seems that sometimes matches are, like you say, filler matches, and then sometimes suddenly they do something really great, like when they had... You know, Lay Cool and Mickey James, that whole feud, I thought was awesome. Um, you know, stuff like with girls like that, or Melina, where they were able to do, you know, I quit matches and, you know, like T- uh, not TLC, like hardcore ish matches and stuff like that. And then other times it's just sort of just matches sort of thrown in there. And there would be, I think what it needs for people to get behind it is just a really good storyline. And that's where it sometimes it seems. They don't want to put that effort into it. 
Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a, a very weird. Yeah, I mean, I mean, very valid points uh, that you made right there. Because I mean, I, I can remember just a couple of different years ago. As soon as you said uh, the whole thing about the knockout division, I'm thinking to myself, mm-hmm. man, it, it was entirely different back then. And yeah, it was one of the most highest rated segments when we had the knockouts come out. I mean, we're talking about a completely different time, right, Diamond? I mean, we had Nikki Rocks in there. Uh, we had Absolutely. Rosita, Sarita. Uh, ODB was actually throwing it down. I mean, it was, it was a it was a really good time uh, uh, to to be uh, watching uh, uh, women's wrestling. Um, I'm I'm very curious. What do you think about uh, promotions like Shine and uh, Shimmer's Wrestling as they're you know paving the new way uh, for women's wrestling? Well, I think it's really great because I put on. I mean, I haven't. I'll be honest. I haven't seen any Shine shows. I did do um, a couple of Shimmer shows. You know years back so i know they put on you know really great shows for women so i i guess there's a there's a market for people who like to just watch a whole women's show but again that's that's very much a niche it's you know it's kind of limited you know in terms of the people who want to go and see a show with just girls you know versus people who want to go and see the guys and then they want to see a couple of girls matches as well what do you see as the major differences between the two products overall, as you've been in both promotions, do you mm-hmm. feel like one had more of an edge over the other and giving you the creative freedom to portray your character? Um, I don't know if you can really say it like as a general rule, you know. Um, in both promotions you could, you know, go up and talk to the writers about ideas and stuff. It was it's always a little bit of in any type of you know in this entertainment industry. There's always a little bit of a subjective, you know, whoever, whatever writer you're talking to at the moment, how much they see in you, how much they believe in you, to whether or not they want to, you know, take your idea and maybe, you know, take your input or and run with some of your ideas or whether they want to just, you know, not saying anything about it. Um, in WWE, when I was there, it was probably a little harder because there were so many writers. You know, and they all sort of, you know, there's like a, a hierarchy to where your ideas have to trickle up to the top, which makes it more difficult. Whereas in TNA, it was more, it was just Vince, and you would go up and talk to Vince Russo. So, wow. was, was that a little frustrating for you? Because, I, I mean, we hear some of the, the WWE wrestlers, they say there's like all these writers, there's like eight, 12 writers, and they're all trying to come up with what they want you to do for that mm-hmm. week. Is it kind of like really eight to twelve guys compared to a Vince Russo? You're like, hey Vince, here's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a little frustrating for everyone. I think um, the problem that, as far as I'm concerned, they have is that they do do it just from week to week. You know, rather than really planning ahead and writing out a whole story arc over so and so many months and then basically sticking to it. You know, it seems like every week things change so much, you know, you might have an idea and they have an idea and you're supposed to, you know, arrive at the arena and they say, oh, we're going to do the segment with you. And then they change their mind at the last minute and throw you into something entirely different. So I think just the fact that everything is done so much on the fly hurts the product because then it can't be as refined. You know, if you have like a regular TV show, you know, usually the the writers get together and they write out the whole season and they film it and, and it's the story arcs are clear and defined and, you know, things happen specific times for specific reasons. Whereas with wrestling, you know, it's obviously that there has to be a certain amount of uh, flexibility because of the way that the fans might respond to a storyline that might make you want to change it. But at the same time, when everything's so week to week, it's really difficult to come up with a really good idea, you know, unless you're one of the top guys and obviously they plan it out and you know, they, they spend more time on that. Right, yeah, if you're a top tier, yeah, you're locked every single week. And mm-hmm. and it's funny you mention that because me and Diamond, we've been going back and forth uh, weekly on this. We look at a guy currently in the WWE right now mm-hmm. like a uh, Antonio Cesaro. He is mm-hmm. just a fan favorite amongst diehard Ring of Honor fans and you just yeah. have a sea of angry fans that are like this guy is pure old school wrestling, and he's losing every single week. Uh, it, it seems mm-hmm. like he was one of the hottest things going on. Now it 
kind of seems like WWE doesn't care about him. And I don't really think, to kind of pick up on what you said, I don't think that's the case. It's, it's, it's exactly what you had said, which is you got the writers and, you know, they're doing so much stuff for the top tiers that mm. somebody is bound to get lost in the shuffle, uh, yeah. unfortunately. You know, and, and it always sucks when, when, when that happens. Um, yeah, because it sort of starts, I think, too, you know, with somebody like Antonio Cesari, it was so hot, and then they go, okay, well, it won't hurt him to lose a couple of times to get some other guys over. You know, and then they, he's lost a couple of times, and suddenly they don't know where to go with him storyline-wise. And then they go, okay, well, we'll just use him for the matches. And then they sort of forget to to put him back in the story. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I don't know if that's what happened with him, because I haven't watched that show for a few weeks now, too. But, you know, I mean, some guys, it doesn't hurt them, you know, to just sort of coast for a while, and they can flare back up. I think Antonio Cesaro is one of those, because he's just so good. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that he's going to ever look like a jobber, but it, but it can happen sometimes through no fault of anybody's. Were you able to, to uh, before you had made your exit from TNA, did you have a chance to, to work with the team of uh, Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan? They were there the whole time that I was there. Okay, I was I was wondering the about that. Yeah. Well, well, tell yeah. me, what, what was the what was it like working for the? the trio in a sense of Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff, Dixie Carter versus Vince McMahon. Can you talk about the parallels between the two? Um, lots of parallels were that in terms of creatively and, you know, practically working together, I didn't really have much contact with any of those. You know, because when I was at TNA, the, the, my go-to person was Vince Russo for, you know, storylines and then if we had a segment to do or a match to do, we had the producers and the agents, you know, assigned to those things. So Dixie Carter was around or was approachable or was friendly, and obviously you could put, pitch stuff to her as well, but she wasn't necessarily the person for me to talk to. And the same as uh, Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan, you know, it's hard to say how much involvement they had creatively because that was always sort of denied, you know, that they, that, that, that it was their product. It was really, as far as we knew, it was really been through some sort of creative direction. And, and was it kind of weird to to see him make his exit? Uh, were you there that long for that? Yeah, I was. It was very sad for me because I, I really liked him and I, I like his ideas. I think that he's very, um, he thinks out of the box. You know, he doesn't just sort of think wrestling because he didn't, originally come from wrestling necessarily so I thought he had some really cool ideas and I thought it was sad that he left so and and it just for me obviously not knowing the ins and outs and behind the scenes and stuff it it was surprising let's uh let's stay with TNA for a moment um Mm -hmm. in looking at the product as a whole do you Mm -hmm. feel at times the swapping of titles within a short time frame Hurts the momentum of the person who won. A perfect example, you won a knockouts title in TNA. You held mm-hmm. it for 18 days before you dropped it to a returning mate, uh, Mickey James. You fast yeah. forward to what's been happening in the promotion uh, recently. Uh, we had saw the team of Austin Aries, Bobby Roode. They held the tag titles for just a couple of weeks, and then mm-hmm. they uh, they had a lot of great momentum uh, uh, going in their favor. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, we see the team Austin Aries, Bobby Roode. You mm-hmm. know, they held they held the tag titles for a couple of weeks, a lot of momentum going, and then they run into Chavo and Hernandez, drop right. the titles to them, and it's like, wow, you know, these guys have already been champions multiple times already. Would you yeah. agree that it, that it, it kind of hurts the momentum when you just switch the titles like that all of a sudden? So, so I agree 100%, especially when it's something that's been built up built up for so long. Mm-hmm. You know, like when it comes to me, it's always hard to talk about these things, you know, from your own perspective because it always sounds like, I just wanted to be champ, you know. But for me, it was like that whole storyline had been built up for so long. You know, it was like almost a year we'd been building. You know, I didn't even have that many matches. It was backstage segments. It was a whole thing with me and Velvet and this and that. And then I and I and I make these speeches of we'll have this forever and whatever. And then I win it, and then it's suddenly gone. And it seems kind of like anticlimactic. And then what you say about Bobby Roode and uh, Austin Aries, because they've been building that duo 
for so long, you know, it goes up to this big, you know, sort of climax type thing. And the same thing happened with Velvet. And I thought that was even worse because with Velvet, you know, the whole thing where she's been here so many years and she's never won the title and this is her, like, finally she's winning it. You know, and then the next time she defends it, she loses, and it was just completely, like, pointless. You know, you think, why don't they, you know, she's been waiting for this for so long, and then she should have it, you know, and keep it and defend it, because otherwise it doesn't really, it's just like a fluke win, and it doesn't mean anything. Whereas if you look at a guy like The Rock, who Mm -hmm. dropped the title to Cena at WrestleMania, a lot of people, they may be quick to say, oh, well, that was just, his uh, second title defense, but you got to look at it from that bigger aspect was, which is, you know, it was all about passing the torch, making someone else look like the man. It, you know, if you're going to have somebody mm-hmm. be a champion for for a, a short term, you know, it, the payoff has to be huge. But when you look at examples like what you had just pointed out, it, you yeah. know, you're not, there's nothing really to gain from it, unfortunately. Yeah. And well, it, I agree with you about The Rock, too, because, I mean, he's, he's already – done everything you know he didn't even need to win the title you know I didn't think necessarily okay he wanted to pass it towards Cena but I didn't think that he needed to win it in the first place you know people said maybe they wanted the PR of him being on the red carpet for his movies with the title and everything to you know to give WWE the rub so it was like a political decision or whatever but in terms of him actually winning it from CM Punk I thought that was unnecessary you know, and it didn't really mean anything really anyways because he cause he's already the rock. You know, he's already had it so many times. He's come back as a huge superstar, huge movie star, you know, like the cream of the everything. And then he comes back and he takes it and then he hands it back off again. It doesn't really, you know, it's kind of irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and now everybody's freaking out, wondering if he's going to come back because he had the whole yeah. You know what? What? What's your take? Do you do you think he he should come back one more time, or you think he's done enough? Personally, I think he's done enough. To be honest, I didn't think he needed to. I mean, I'm, sh- I'm sure if he loves it, you know, it seems like he really loves it. And, you know, he's performing and everything. So then, if he wants to do it, then sure, he should have the. It's not gonna. It's not like he's old and he can't move anymore. You know, he can still perform just as well. Um, you know, from a I don't know, artistic standpoint, I would have said, you know, for him to not come back at all because he'd already, he left on a high, you know, I didn't think he needed to come back at all Um, or maybe like as an ambassador or like as a manager or something like that. But if he wants to do it, then, you know, life's a playground. He should be able to play. You know, on that note, I wasn't even going to ask you this question, but I got to pick your brain because Mm -hmm. CNA President Dixie Carter, she said something that was kind of, Interesting, they kind of raised a couple of eyebrows. She was quoted in a azcentral.com mm-hmm. interview saying that Hulk Hogan is more popular mm-hmm. than The Rock and that if you were to put the two, like, in the middle of nowhere, like, for example, mm-hmm. Africa, who would everybody in Africa run to more? Would it be Hulk Hogan or would it be The Rock? And I kind of looked at that question and mm-hmm. I, I'm a comic book buff, so I, I look at that question and I'm kind of saying to myself, that's like asking which Joker was the best. Michael, uh, you know, uh, Jack Nicholson in uh, mm-hmm. Tim Burton's 1989 Batman or mm-hmm. Christopher Nolan's Heath Ledger uh, uh, yeah. Joker. You know, that's like comparing mm-hmm. two different generations. Uh, well, mm-hmm. if, you, if you were put in that position, you had to choose, what, 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 who do you think would be more popular in Africa? Well, I don't know if it's a question of more popular. I think Hulk Hogan defined pro wrestling. Because mm-hmm. um, when I first started wrestling, not so much here, but, you know, more in Europe, if I said I was doing pro wrestling or worked for WWE, whatever, some people don't know what it is. But it, And then I would say, oh, you know, the thing that Hulk Hogan does. And people would go, oh, okay. So, like, he's still, his name is still synonymous with pro wrestling. Even people who don't know what WWE is or what pro wrestling is, if they hear Hulk Hogan, they have an idea of what it is. And if you say The Rock, it, they won't make the same connection. So I do believe in that term, he's more of a, he's always going to be the icon. You know, he's the first and the last sort of thing in that, in that, in that sense. I think, you know, when it comes to performing now, 
who would wrestling fans rather see? I would say it's The Rock, hands down. You know, like in a you know in a, in ring, you know capacity, or whatever. But I think Hulk Hogan will always be. He will. He's equal to the word pro wrestling. When you look at it like that, yeah, yeah. Something I've uh, been enjoying to watch uh, every now and then when I get the chance to watch mm-hmm. watch it is uh, mm-hmm. you've been doing something on uh, Russell TV, uh, School of Wrestling. Uh, knowledge. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I actually like that. How did the opportunity to do that come about? Um, well, I went back to England, um, when was it? July last year. And um, to go back then, I did um, a couple of shows out there for Pro Wrestling Eve and uh, New Generation Wrestling. And I did a couple of seminars and then... Um, Alex Shane, who runs the FWA there, and he does the Wrestle Talk TV show. Um, do you know about the Wrestle Talk TV show? Yeah, yeah, I watch it every time. He's up on the, you know, the internet, and has been on Challenge in the UK and everything, and he's brought in guests and stuff like that. So um, he asked me to be a guest on the show, and then as I was there, he had this, it was actually his idea, so he had this idea for these little, you know, snippets of me sort of giving advice on wrestling and life sort of thing. And so we filmed a whole bunch of segments and, you know, he's been airing that. So we filmed them all at the same time and then he's been airing them sporadically. So that's been cool. Yeah, I've been, I've, been, I've actually been enjoying that. Uh, now you're going to be doing okay. some more of those? Well, um, I'd love to, you know, if I if I get back over there. Something I think that's uh, really cool that uh, most people probably don't know about you that you studied film and drama for a few years. Yes. It, yeah, it took you to the point where you actually directed an independent uh, foreign film. Um, now that you've had the opportunity to be on both sides of the camera, uh, mm-hmm. which one uh, do you uh, enjoy more and, and why? You know, it's interesting because I've been asking myself the same question. <laughs> um, because I am, I'm really passionate about performing, and I love acting, and it's a really um, big thrill. And I've been, obviously, I came out to LA to do that, um, and I've done some indie films, and I've just been on a web series called Television, uh, which which listeners can look at on blip. TV forward slash Television. That's Sean S E A N. Uh, I'm on episode so to six and seven, um, but anyways. So I've I've done you know a few things and but I also I just produced a short film that's called Lucille Means Light and we're still finishing up the editing and everything like that. But when it comes to being on set and this was a short film that I wrote and then I put everything together and I was directing it um, and I had a really cool, awesome you know a few people um, helping me with it. But just being on set and sort of translating what you see in your head onto, you know, what you're seeing in the room and to people saying your words and, you know, being involved with the camera, catching what you want to see. It's just like an exhilarating experience. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of sense of achievement, I'm wondering whether I... I'm more excited about that. I definitely want to make more stuff. I can only relate uh, to it just 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 a snippet because I I did a little bit of uh, of theater right on up uh, until think like, sophomore year in uh, mm-hmm. high school, and I was also on the the side of production. And mm-hmm. for me, you know, I, as much as I, I had like performing, I I enjoyed all the magic that was done, mm-hmm. you know, behind the scenes leading up uh, to it. I, I think that's more of a fun thrill ride uh, in itself. But, you know, to, to yeah. each its own, you know. But, but um, yeah, I, I thought that, you know, this has got to be interesting for you because it's like, especially like the times that you do go into the ring and you're performing and mm-hmm. you kind of have that, that director standpoint of, you know, okay, I know where the camera is. I know what, yeah. what shots they're probably going to be going for. Does does that help you a lot when you're in the ring? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it takes a while to get to get used to all that because you know at, at the beginning, all you're thinking is about about is the next move and did you forget something and you know there's so many things to think about because obviously you put the match together 
and then you want to, um, you know, remember all the sequences and everything like that, and you have to remember in between to take your time to, you know, show your character, and then also to think about where the cameras are and to actually look and see which camera has the red light so that's where you should direct your attention towards, you know. So it takes a while to get comfortable enough to be able to think about all those things at the same time and not, you know, panic, as it were. But as you said, like when you put a match together, you have you also have that directorial, you know, thing with it because you're part of the creative process of, you know, making the dramatics of the match, and then you get to perform it as well. You know, one question that's been lingering on my mind, uh, mm-hmm. going back to wrestling for just a hot second, and uh, maybe you can kind of clear it up. You mm-hmm. had a very interesting storyline with Angelina Love. Mm-hmm. That I thought was just really, really must see TV because I'm, I was kicking back and, and I, I've been following your career since WWE. So mm-hmm. I, I, when you left WWE, I definitely was sad. But when I heard you went to TNA, I was like, yes, awesome. <laughs> oh, thank that, you. That, and now the auntie's picked up and and it did pick <laughs> up. And I, I thought your storyline with Angelina Love was was very interesting as as you, mm-hmm. you had her under this hypnosis spell and she was pretty much doing your bidding. But it, it just yeah. kind of seemed like before that storyline could reach its uh, uh, climax, mm-hmm. it, you know, it just poof, just and folks are kind of wondering what you know what's going on. Was there a, a, a finish line to that 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 maybe you could share with folks? Like I know sometimes when maybe your favorite series ends and you don't get yeah. the final episode, there's usually some some leaked script floating around. Was there a finish to that? Well, I don't know. It was it was. It was as surprising to me as it was to you, because I sort of I walked into Bound for Glory, you know, the champ. Obviously, we had the match. Um, Velvet beat Mickey, I think. I sprayed blood in Karen's face, who was arguably the top. You know, even though she wasn't a wrestler, she was sort of the top. She became right after that the top knockout heel, and then the next week. We were all standing in the ring in the line, and she never even acknowledged me. I mean, that's not a criticism on her, obviously. It was written that way. But it just seemed odd that that was never mentioned, and I was pretty much never mentioned again. So if you're asking about a finish to the storyline, I would assume we'd have to ask Vince Russo, because I'm sure he had something thought out that perhaps the new writing team didn't want to continue. Shame on their part, because I, I would have loved to have seen what, how that would have came about. I mean, you kind of gave me some homework right there. Maybe Vince Russo. <laughs> <laughs> Vince yeah. Russo next, folks. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm assuming that there would have been something, you know, with me and Angelina splitting up and maybe her and Velvet getting back together as a team or something. I'm sure that's what people would have liked to have seen anyway. This uh this question had uh came in uh earlier uh, as we were talking. Mm-hmm. I got to show him some love. It comes from <laughs> Dra- Dragon Master on Twitter. Mm-hmm. He says, "I have a question for you, Winter. Are you coming back to TNA?" It doesn't look that way. Would you like to go back? Um I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't, like, not like to. It's not like I didn't like it there. Um, Ideally, I would like to, you know, focus on acting and and stuff like that. Um, The thing was with TNA, of course, was the beauty was that you would have the opportunity to do both things, you know, at the same time. So that was cool. So I wouldn't say necessarily that I wouldn't, but I'm not. I'm not sad if I don't go back. Right now, you're in a position where you're you're good. You're okay. Yes, yes, and I'm I'm very focused on you know the acting and producing too. I definitely, as I said, I want to you know have more projects that I'm still putting together and working on. So. And I definitely got to show some love to those that follow the promotion, Shine and Shimmers Wrestling. Some of them had asked me, you, you, please ask her, please ask her, and, and I'm asking for you guys, mm-hmm. okay. Um, they've seen the little bit of buzz that Angelina Love has been making in Shine. And some folks mm-hmm. wanted to know if it's possible that you can maybe entertain 
the idea of, you know, continuing your acting career and mm-hmm. maybe uh, working for a promotion like Shimmer or Shine on a uh, permanent basis. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, you know, because the two things wouldn't interfere with each other. So in terms of, you know, wrestling bookings, I'm not going out and, you know, networking and pushing for it. But if somebody asks me, do you want to come and do my show, I usually, you know, I usually go do it. So it's not like I wouldn't want to go there. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, cool. What uh, current projects uh, are you working on right now that you can uh, tell folks about? Uh, well, as I said, this uh, web series, Television, the P E L E V I S E A N, and they can watch it on blip.tv forward slash Television, episode six and seven is the ones that I'm in. Um, I just did an indie film called Stay Inside that's supposed to be coming out later this year. Um, I made my own short called Lucille Means Light, which I'm, it's sort of a period piece. Um, but, of course, I'm very excited about it because it's like my own little baby. And I will let people know when that's finished and they can see it and stuff like that. Um, I do a YouTube show which is just me talking, basically. So, But I'm thinking about, you know, some other ideas of making it a little more, having some guests on, stuff like that. So that's youtube.com forward slash Katarina's Infamy. Um, I'm in a film called Adam 8. That's in development. So I don't know exactly when we start shooting that. What's the plot of that mm-hmm. one? It's like a sci-fi film where on Earth all the men are dead. So a bunch of girls go to another planet and they've been harvesting men to bring back to repopulate the Earth. And then, of course, you know, trouble ensues. So, But that's kind of cool because it's got the Amazonian, you know, women in in charge and power theme going on, which which is always nice. I dig that. Women are, are trying to yeah. reach males. I like that. It kind of reminds me, and it's on the tip of my tongue. It's going to come to me when I least expect it, but it kind of reminds me of that Roddy Roddy Piper uh, movie, just script-wise. Oh, uh, uh, They Live? Not not They Live. It was the, it was the oh, okay. next one he did after that where oh, where okay. it was uh, him and a bunch of women. and. <laughs> well, that sounds like a good time. See, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it'll, it'll come to me when I least expect it, but yeah, that, yeah. that sounds pretty badass. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to uh, check that out. Um, yeah, now, so that's clear. There's a Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash Adam8, and that's Adam and 8, the number. So if people want to have a look at that and like the page, that'd be awesome. Okay, okay. And, folks, we'll make sure we provide those links uh, for you all in the episode description and uh, put it on the uh, website after the show's over. Um, on a side note, correct me if I'm wrong. I hear you're a Lex Luthor fan. Is that correct? I'm a Lex Luthor from Smallville fan. Okay, so you you like the Michael Very Rose specifically. Okay, yeah. okay. I thought I, I was going to be able to go a little more further. Than that. Huh? I thought I was going to be able to go a little bit more further than that. But I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh. Well, that's sort of really the first time I came across him. To be honest, I'm not like a big. I'm a huge Lobo fan, you know, comic wise. But other than that, I'm not really like a connoisseur or anything, you know, of comics. But I used to watch Smallville, and I just, I love Lex Luthor's character because he's so, you know, he's good, but he's always got that little bit of evil side to him, you know, that little bit of he'll do anything to gain, you know. And then they they tease his heel turn over like three seasons, you know, and every time you think that, oh, he's turned, he's done something really bad, and then you find out that he actually didn't, and it turn, you know, it like it, he turns back, but you always have that little bit of doubt, and he's always on that fence between good and evil, and I just find that so absolutely fascinating. By chance, did you see the final episode of Smallville? No. Then I know he had made his return. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I won't. I won't spoil it. But yeah, I stopped when he was no longer in it, and then I never really got back in, which is a yeah. shame because um, also in later episodes, Sam Whitworth from Being Human is in it, and I'm a big fan of his. So, oh, he's the man. Yeah, he's yeah, he's done awesome. some awesome stuff. It's, it's kind of like a running gag with him though. It's like every time he pops up in something, he's always either getting killed or 
<laughs> he's he's <laughs> playing the bad guy. <laughs> and it even kind of uh, tripped him up a little bit. He said, I wish I could stop being, getting killed in every single project I'm in. <laughs> well, they should be human. He's already dead. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. You know, I, I think, you, I don't know about you, but I, I think, uh, I don't know what they're going to be doing with this new Man of Steel movie, but um, mm-hmm. cause, you know, we don't know if there's even going to be a Lex Luthor uh, in that one, but if oh. they were to entertain the idea, uh, I, I don't think they need to look that far. I, I think uh, Michael Rosenbaum, that's his name, I, I think he would be phenomenal to come on back in a theatrical yeah. uh, 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 version uh of that, take yeah. that Lex Luthor to the next level. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, that would be pretty badass. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there any, uh, I know you say you haven't watched the product in a minute, uh, but, but last you tuned in, were there any angles or storylines or, or, or certain wrestler or even a stable that kind of had you go, I'm kind of liking this, this is pretty kick-ass. Well, The Shield, uh, I was sort of obsessed, or I am sort of obsessed with Dean, Dean Ambrose a little bit. Um, I really liked the Shield thing. I felt a little bit like they brought him in, them in so strong. And then after the first pay per view, when they won the TLC match, I felt that was the point where they should have started off with a really hot storyline, and they sort of missed the boat on that. Hmm. Um, but I, not that that means that you know that cannot happen now. So I think that was awesome. Uh, obviously, Fandango. Everybody's a huge fan of Fandango. Um, CM Punk, obviously, I think he's just one of the best talkers there is. Paul Heyman could read me a phone book, and I would be interested. Yes. <laughs> That's the man. Yeah. So, oh, I should take girls. Hmm, I don't know. Yeah, for the girls. Well, that's the thing, you see, because of the story. Like, they don't have any proper... Uh, you know, they need to have, like, a proper... You know, I don't understand why Layla isn't more in the forefront. Because she's a really fantastic character. She's, you know, she has so much charisma and she's really gotten so good in the ring. I don't know why she's not doing more. And Alicia Fox would be doing more, I think, as well, like storyline wise. Yeah, I agree. You know, she has matches now and then, but other than that, it's sort of like she's, you forget that she's there, but you shouldn't because she's awesome. The same thing with Christian. You know, talk about, you know, you forget they're there. It's like, where's Christian? <laughs> Like, you know he's healthy, but he's like, where's Christian? Yeah. Kind of like yeah. a where's Waldo type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is crazy right now. Uh, give give the links one more time for folks to uh, to check you out at. Uh, yeah, so my Twitter is at Katarina's Infamy. My Facebook is facebook.com forward slash Katarina's Infamy. And then my YouTube is also youtube.com forward slash Katarina's Infamy. Oh, and my website, katarinasinfamy.com, where you can not only, you know, check out different links and this and that and news and whatever, but you can also buy my wonderful Miraculous T-shirt and autograph pictures, obviously. Well, long time fan over here. <laughs> sure. so so yeah, I know where I'll be after the show is over, and that's no bull. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, out, look out for Gatesburg, Maryland. That's going to be me. Awesome. Yeah. Well, look, I thank you so much for, for doing this interview. And I, I always tell guests that come on by, you're more than welcome to come on back. I do want for us to stay in contact. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you on back, whether it's talk about a movie project or, um, mm-hmm. you know, if you're doing some charity work or, you know, just want to shoot the hay, yeah. you're more than welcome to come on back. It's truly awesome to have you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been really fun. All right. Well, you enjoy the rest of the night and the and week. You too. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only, the beautiful Katarina Waters, a.k.a. Cat. Kick-ass interview right there. Thank you for listening to tonight's show. If you enjoyed our coverage, be sure to check us out every Tuesday night at 11 p.m. Eastern at blogtalkradio.com slash the RCWR show for all the latest in wrestling news and beyond.